And now you, uh, I'm sorry I don't have Nick Snickers for everybody. <laughs> but what I'd like to have you do is kind of wrestle through the biblical texts with me today. The Christmas Eve texts when you're a pastor are just delicious for preaching. I mean, it's the core, the center of who we are and what we do. And there's so much that can be said in so many different ways with the Christmas Eve and Christmas Day texts. And then afterwards, there's some texts that aren't quite as easy to preach on and some that aren't quite as easy to understand. And the one today kind of borders on that. And out of those texts, I've claimed the phrase as my sermon title, the fullness of time. The fullness of time. It's a phrase found in our reading from Galatians that Anita read just a moment ago. And have you ever wondered what that phrase means, the fullness of time, and what its implications are for us today? How can you quantify or measure time with words like full or empty? If we look at a calendar on the wall, I suppose that we could say that the time is almost full. The year 2014 is almost over. Each of us can reflect on the past 12 months and make some qualitative decisions about the year. Were goals reached? Were dreams realized? Did all relationships thrive and grow? Were they renewed? Or was there some pain and brokenness experienced in some relationships? Did new relationships begin? Old jobs lost, new jobs found, no jobs available, graduations, births, baptisms, confirmations, deaths. Did health improve or did health decline? Was it a positive or negative year for you? How full was your year? On the other hand, 2015 is poised to begin in just a few days. Could that be what fullness of time means? The idea that some future event or time is about to begin is almost upon us. As we read about violence on our city streets in the United States, the horrific acts of violence by ISIS in the Mideast, the continued war and violence in Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iraq, Yemen, Egypt, Israel, Palestine, and other places, is this the year when there will be a breakthrough in peace talks? Is this the year when people of different colors, languages, cultures, and religions will learn to be more tolerant of each other and to live in peace and harmony? Would that be enough fullness to pray for and to hope for in 2015? Or will this be the year when the drought in California and other areas of the Southwest will finally be broken, giving relief to farmers who are so dependent on precious water. That's the kind of fullness and fulfillment that some people will be praying for. We as individuals, families, and a nation have just paused to celebrate the birth of a child born in the humblest of settings in a village that would likely remain very obscure if this baby hadn't been born there. He was, of course, Jesus of Nazareth. I suggested on Christmas Eve that the time and place in which he was born is not so unlike what's going on in that same region today. The people of Israel and Palestine, living under strict Roman rule, were yearning for a reclaiming of place and identity just as the people of Israel and Palestine remain in conflict today, yearning for a reclaiming of place and identity. How would they define fullness of time today? 
Our second lesson from Galatians begins with the phrase, but when the fullness of time had come. If you have spent any time in Bible study or heard more than a few Christmas sermons, you know that Old Testament prophets like Isaiah, our first lesson for today, had been giving voice to God's promises that he would send a Messiah, a Savior. They've been hearing that for centuries. And each time that the people of Israel heard still another prophet reiterate those promises, they hoped and expected that this promise would become reality in their lifetime. And then centuries passed. And as the quality of leadership declined under the kingship, or after the kingship of Saul, David, and Solomon, as empire after empire conquered and laid to ruin Israel, as the temple was destroyed, as the people were dispersed, hopelessness and despair were not uncommon feelings. How long, Lord? How long must we wait and live like this? When will it be the time? And then, on a cold December night, perhaps not so unlike our just experienced December 24th, the night air exploded with the light, sounds, and sights that must have rivaled a contemporary Disneyland Christmas show. An angel choir announcing, it's full, it's full, the time is full. Well, you know that those aren't the exact words that they used. You've heard those words enough times to know that. I borrowed them, the real ones, from St. Paul in our second lesson for today. But you know what I mean, don't you? The angels essentially announced, it's time, he's finally here. The text reads, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as children. And while we know this child as Jesus of Nazareth, the Messiah, our Lord and Savior, God sent this child into the world both to heal the broken relationship between God and humanity, and also to expand the scope of his plan from Old Covenant to New Covenant. God's Son, Jesus, was born under the law to fulfill the law, but then to kick the doors of heaven wide open. And to fulfill the law, there were certain Jewish rites and practices that needed to be completed, which is what took Joseph and Mary and the baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. It's in that temple where those rites were observed or celebrated. 